Section 1 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. April. These rugged wintry days I scarce could bear, did I not know that in the early spring, when wild March winds upon their errands sing, thou wouldst return, bursting on this still air, like those same winds, when startled from their lair they hunt up violets, and free swift brooks from icy cares, even as thy clear looks bid my heart bloom, and sing, and break all care. When drops with welcome rain the April day, my flowers shall find their April in thine eyes, save there the rain in dreamy clouds doth stay, as loath to fall out of those happy skies. Yet sure, my love, thou art most like to May, that comes with steady sun when April dies. Lowell End of section 1 This recording is in the public domain. Section 2 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Procession of Spring A morning of radiant lids, or the dance of the earth opened wide. The bees chose their flowers, the snub kids upon hind legs went sportive or plied, nosing hard at the dugs to be filled. There was milk, honey, music to make. Up their branches the little birds build, chirrup, drone, bleat, and buzz ringed the lake. O oh, shining in sunlight, chief, after water and water's caress, was the young bronze orange leaf that clung to the trees as a tress shooting lucid tendrils to wed with the vine hook tree or pole like arachne launched out on her thread then the maiden her dusky stole in the span of the black starred zone gathered up for her footing fleet as one that had toil of her own she followed the lines of wheat tripping straight through the field green blades to the groves of olive gray downy gray golden tinged and to glades where the pear blossom thickens the spray in a night like the snow-packed storm pear apple almond plum not wintry now pushing warm and she touched them with finger and thumb as the vine hook closes she smiled recounting again and again corn wine fruit oil like a child with the meaning known to men george meredith end of section two section three of birds and all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the American Bittern Botaurus lentiginosus This curious bird has several local names. It is called the stake driver, booming bittern, and thunder pumper in consequence of its peculiar cry. It was once thought that this noise was made by using a hollow reed, but the peculiar tone is possibly due to the odd shaped neck of the bird. Gibson says you hear of the stake driver but cannot find his stake. We have never seen a bittern except along water courses. He is a solitary bird. When alarmed by the approach of someone, the bird sometimes escapes recognition by standing on its short tail motionless, with its bill pointing skyward, in which position, aided by its dull coloring, it personates a small snag or stump or some other growth about it. This bird has long legs, yellow-green in color, which trail awkwardly behind it and serve as a sort of rudder when it flies. It has a long, crooked neck and lengthy yellow bill edged with black. The body is variable as to size, but sometimes is said to measure 34 inches. The tail is short and rounded. 
In color, this peculiar bird is yellowish-brown, mottled with various shades of brown above, and below buff, white, and brown. It is not a skillful architect, but places its rude nest on the ground, in which may be found three to five grayish-brown eggs. The habitat of the American bittern covers the whole of temperate and tropical North America, north to latitude about 60 degrees, south to Guatemala, Cuba, Jamaica, and the Bermudas. It is occasionally found in Europe. Frank Forrester included the bittern among the list of his game birds, and it is asked what higher authority we can have than this. The flesh is regarded as excellent food. End of section 3《Section Three》。Section Four of《Birds and All Nature》Volume Seven, Number Four, April 1900, recorded for LibriVox.org by Jill Ingle. Our Little Martyrs by George Klingle. Do we care, you and I, for the songbirds winging by, ruffled throat and bosom's sheen? Thrill of wing of gold or green, sapphire, crimson, gorgeous dye, lost or found across the sky, midst the glory of the air, birds who tenderer colors wear. What to us the free bird's song, breath of passion, breath of wrong, wood heart's orchestra, her life, breath of love and breath of strife, joy's fantasies, anguish breath, cries of doubt and cries of death? Shall we care when nesting time brings no birds from any clime? Not a voice or ruby wing, not a single nest to swing? Midst the reeds or higher up, like a dainty fairy cup, not a single little friend, all the way as footsteps wend, here and there through every clime, not a bird at any time? Does it matter? Do we care? What the feathers women wear cost the world? Must all birds die? May they never, never fly safely through their native air. Slaughter meets them everywhere. Scorned be the hands that touch such spoil. Let women pity and recoil from traffic barbarous and grave, and quickly strive the birds to save. End of section four. This recording is in the public domain. Section 5 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. Little Guests in Feathers. Nelly Hart Woodworth. A Brooklyn naturalist who gives much time to bird study told me that as his rooms became overfull of birds, he decided to thin them out before the approach of winter. Accordingly, he selected two song sparrows and turned one of them adrift, thinking to let the other go the next morning. The little captive was very happy for a few hours, flying about the wild garden in the rear of the house a few square rods where more than four hundred varieties of native plants were growing. It was not long, however, before a homesick longing replaced the new happiness, and the bird returned to the cage, which was left upon the piazza roof. The next morning the second sparrow was given his freedom. Nothing was seen of him for a week, when he came to the window, beat his tired wings against the pane, and sank down upon the window sill, so overjoyed at finding himself at home that he was fairly bursting with song. His throat trembled with the ecstasy, the feathers ruffling as the melody rose from his heart and deluged the air with sweetness. His joy was too complete for further experiment. The first sparrow was again released, only to return at nightfall and go promptly to bed, at the general retiring hour. This hour, by the way, varied indefinitely, the whole aviary accommodating their hours to those of their master, rising with him and settling for the night as he turned off the gas. After this, same bird was repeatedly sent out, like Noah's dove, coming home at evening till after many days it came no more an implicit confidence in the rightness of all intention doubtless making it an easy prey to some evil design 
a handsome hermit thrush from the same aviary domesticated in my room after an hour or two abroad is as homesick for his cage as is a child for its mother when this bird came into my possession his open and discourteous disapproval of women was humiliating his attitude was not simply endurance but open revolt a deep-rooted hatred for the entire sex when after long weeks of acquaintance this hostility was overcome he followed me about the room stood beside me at my work and has since been unchanging in a pathetic devotion he plants his tiny feet in my pen tray and throws the pens upon the floor he stands on tiptoe before the mirror staring with curious eyes at the strange rival till awe is replaced by anger and the brown wings beat in unavailing effort to reach the insolent mimic when shown a worm he trembles in excited anticipation his little feet dancing upon the floor his wings moving rapidly while he utters a coaxing entreating syllable the song is sweetest when raindrops fall or when the room is noisy and confused i notice too that he is more tuneful before a rain i must confess that he keeps late hours that he is often busy getting breakfast when orthodox birds should be dreaming his active periods being liable to fall at any hour of the night more especially if there be a moon an intensely sentimental nature may be unable to sleep when the beauty of the world is so strongly emphasized his last frolic was with a frog the children smuggled into the house chasing it around the room darting at it with wide open beak advancing and retreating in a frenzied merriment as the cage door is often left open he is sometimes lost briefly at one of these times i decided that he had gone to sleep under the bed and would be quite safe till morning before daylight my mother called to me from the next room that there was something in her bed and sure enough the truant stood upon her pillow his wings almost brushing her face the song of an indigo bird kept in my room is often followed by from two to four subdued notes of exceeding richness and sweetness Aside from the ordinary song, sometimes reduced to the syllables, meet, meet, I'll meet you, words unheard save by aid of a vivid imagination, the bird has an exquisite warble, loud and exhilarating, as rounded and velvety as the bluebirds. When the bird became familiar with the room, its occupants, and the sunshine streaming in through the window, his happiness crystallized in song, a rarely beautiful strain unheard before the feathers on his throat would ruffle as a wave of song ran upward filling the room with a delicious music unlike the hermit thrush which has silent preoccupied hours and is given to meditation the indigo has no indolent days and is a happy sunny-hearted creature his attitudes are like the catbirds, erecting crest, flirting body and tail, or drooping the latter in the precise manner of the catbird. Judged by indigo dress standards, this bird is in an undress uniform, quite as undress as it is uniform, as somebody says, a result of the late moult. For all this, his changeable suit is not only becoming but decidedly modern warp of blue and woof of green that change with changing light from indigo to intense emerald then there are browns and drabs in striking contrasts colors worn by indigos while young and inexperienced the confused shades of the upper breast replaced by sparrowy stripes beneath my bird is a night singer pouring out his tuneful plaint as freely in the wee small hours 
as when the sun is shining, its notes as sweet as if he knew that if we must sing a night song, it should be sweet that some heart may hear and be the better for our singing. Later in the day, a purple finch in the cedar tangle challenged the vocalist in notes so entrancing that one's breath was hushed involuntarily. The same finch sang freely during the entire season in notes replete with personality, a distinct translation of the heart language. Others might sing and sing, but this superb voice rose easily above them all, a warbling, gurgling, effervescing strain, finished and polished in notes of infinite tenderness. Short conversations preceded and followed the musical ecstasy, a love song intended for one ear only, while wings twinkled and fluttered in rhythm with the pulsing heart of the melodist. No doubt he was telling of a future castle in the air beside which castles in Spain are of little value. End of section 5《Section Six of Birds and All Nature, Volume Seven, Number Four, April nineteen hundred, recorded for LibriVox.org by Abby. Planting the trees. What do we plant when we plant the trees? We plant the ships which will cross the seas. We plant the masts to carry the sails. We plant the planks to withstand the gales, the keel, the keelson, the beams and knee. We plant the ship when we plant the tree. What do we plant when we plant the tree? We plant the homes for you and me. We plant the rafters, the shingles, the floors. We plant the studding, the lass, the doors, the beams, the sidings, all parts that be. We plant the home when we plant the tree. What do we plant when we plant the tree? A thousand things we daily see. We plant the spires that outtower the crag. We plant the staff on our country's flag. We plant the shade from the hot sun free. We plant all these when we plant the tree. End of section six. This recording is in the public domain. Section 7 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Origin of the Easter Egg, Eleonora Kinsley Marble. Now is the time of year when we feel called upon to inform our readers that the peacock does not lay the pretty colored Easter eggs. This valuable bit of information the great American humorist feels called upon to make year after year and though we elder folk smile and the young query how many of us are familiar with the history of the custom of observing the closing of lent with the egg feast one must go back to the persians for the first observance of the egg day according to one of the ancient cosmogonies all things were produced from an egg hence called the mundane egg this cosmogony was received in Persia, and on this account there obtained among the people of that country a custom of presenting each other with an egg, the symbol of a new beginning of time on every New Year's Day. That is, on the day when the sun enters Aries, the Persians reckoning the beginning of the new year from that day, which occurred in March. The doctrine of the mundane egg was not confined to the limits of Persia, but was spread together with the practice of presenting New Year's eggs through various other countries. But the New Year was not kept on the day when the sun enters Aries, or at least it ceased, in process of time, to be so kept. In Persia itself, the introduction of the Mohammedan faith brought with it the removal of New Year's Day. Among the Jews, the season of the ancient New Year became that of the Passover and among the Christians the season of the Passover has become that of Easter. Among all these changes, the custom of giving an egg at the sun's entrance into Aries still prevails. The egg has also continued to be held as a symbol, 
and the sole alteration is the prototype. At first it was said to be the beginning of time, and now it is called the symbol of the resurrection. One sees, therefore, what was the real origin of the Easter egg of the Greek and Roman churches. From a book entitled An Extract from the Ritual of Pope Paul V, made for Great Britain, it appears that the paschal egg is held by the Roman church to be an emblem of the resurrection, and that it is made holy by a special blessing of a priest. In Russia, Easter Day is set apart for paying visits. The men go to each other's house in the morning and introduce themselves by saying, Christ is arisen. The answer is, Yes, he is risen. Then they embrace, exchange eggs, and, sad to relate, drink a great deal of brandy. An account of far older date says, Every year against Easter Day, the Russians' color are dye red with Brazil wood, a great number of eggs, of which every man and woman giveth one unto the priest of the parish upon Easter Day in the morning. And moreover, the common people carry in their hands one of these red eggs, not only upon Easter Day, but also three or four days after. And gentlewomen and gentlemen have eggs gilded, which they carry in like manner. They use the eggs, as they say, for great love, and in token of the resurrection, whereof they rejoice. For when two friends meet during the Easter holidays, they come and take one another by the hand. The one of them saith, The Lord our Christ is risen. The other answereth, It is so of a truth. Then they kiss and exchange their eggs, both men and women, continuing and kissing four days together. There is an old English proverb on the subject of Easter eggs, namely, I'll warrant you an egg for Easter. In some parts of England, notably in the north, the eggs are colored by means of dyeing drugs in which the eggs are boiled. These eggs are called paste eggs, also pace and pasc all derived from Pascha, Easter. End of section 7. This recording is in the public domain. Section number 8 of Birds in All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org. Moral Value of Forests. A comparatively untouched phase of the question of forest destruction is brought out in a book called North American Forests and Forestry by Ernest Brucknan, a prominent Western forester. The author incidentally discusses the part which our forests have had in shaping American character and our national history. This phase of the matter is interesting both as a historical study and as a suggestion of the moral as well as economic loss which must come with the denudation of forest areas. All thinking Americans know that the forests are an important factor in our commercial life, and Mr. Brunkin makes an impressive statement of the way in which the lumber industry permeates all the nation's activities. But the part played by the vast primeval forests in creating American character is not so generally realized. From the earliest colonial times, the forests have had a moral and political effect in shaping our history. In the 17th century, England was dependent upon Norway and the Baltic provinces for its timber for ships. This was in various ways disadvantageous for England, so the American colonists were encouraged with bounties to cut ship timbers, masts, and other lumber for European export. This trade, however, was found to be unprofitable on account of the long ocean voyage. So the American lumbermen began to develop a profitable market in the West Indies. This was straightway interdicted by the short-sighted British government, and the bitter and violent opposition of the colonists against the tyrannical policy ceased only with the end of British dominion. From that time to the present, the forests of America have exercised a most important influence upon the nation especially in creating the self-reliance which is the chief trait of the american character the trappers hunters explorers and backwoods settlers who went forth alone in the dense forest received a schooling such as nothing else could give as the forest closed behind the settler he knew his future and that of his family must henceforth depend upon himself his axe his rifle and the few simple utensils he had brought with him it was a school that did not teach the graces made men past masters in courage tenacity and resourcefulness 
it bred a new simple and forceful type of man out of the midst of that backwoods life came abraham lincoln the greatest example of american statesmanship the nation has produced in him was embodied all the inherent greatness of his early wilderness surroundings with scarcely a trace of its coarser characteristics as mr brunken says mere remembrance of what the forests have given us in the past should be enough to inspire a wish to preserve them as long as possible to stop wanton waste by forest fires and even to repair our losses by planting new forests as they do in europe the time has gone when the silence and dangers of the forest were our chief moulders of sturdy character but it is undeniable that the pioneer blood that still runs so richly in american veins has much to do with causing the idea of philippine expansion to appeal so powerfully to the popular imagination the prophets who see in the expansion idea the downfall of the nation forget that the same spirit subdued the american wilderness and created the freest government and some of the finest specimens of manhood the world has ever seen end of section eight this recording is in the public domain section nine of birds and all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by larry wilson easter lilies though long in wintry sleep ye lay the powers of darkness could not stay your coming at the call of day proclaiming spring nay like the faithful virgins wise with lamps replenished ye arise ere dawn the death anointed eyes of christ the king john b tab end of section nine this recording is in the public domain section ten of birds and all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by betty b the scarlet ibis guara rubra ibises are distributed throughout the warmer parts of the globe and number according to the best authorities about thirty species of which four occur in north america the scarlet ibis is a south american species though it has been recorded from florida louisiana and new mexico the ibises are silent birds and live in flocks during the entire year they feed along the shores of lakes bays and salt-water lagoons and on mud flats over which the tide rises and falls their food consists of crustaceans frogs and small fish colonies of ibises build nests in reedy marshes or in low trees and bushes not far from good feeding grounds three to five pale greenish eggs marked with chocolate are found in the coarse bulky nest of reeds and weed stalks these birds are not so numerous as they once were they have been wantonly destroyed for their plumage alone the flesh being unfit for food end of section ten this recording is in the public domain section eleven of birds and all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b chippy a baby mockingbird martha crombie wood one bright day early in august i sat by my window writing my attention was soon attracted by a pair of mockingbirds which were flying back and forth between a peach tree and a plum tree near by these birds having been near neighbors of mine for some time i had named them jack and jill a family quarrel seemed brewing for jack evidently found more good points in the plum tree and scolded jill for spending any time in the peach tree while jill was equally impressed with the favorable aspect of the peach tree i thought they were trying to decide upon a location for a nest and was soon convinced that i was right for jack ended the family disagreement by taking a twig in his bill and carrying it to the plum tree where he began balancing it among some of the small branches his mate continued to scold from her place in the peach tree but when he paid no attention to her and went on with his work she soon relented 
and flew down to offer her assistance with very little difficulty these birds could carry a twig six or eight inches long and a quarter of an inch in diameter several of these large twigs were laid loosely among the forks of three small branches and then a more compact structure was placed upon this foundation this was made of smaller twigs with roots and stems of bermuda grass twisted among them a lining composed of horsehair grass cotton a piece of satin ribbon some three inches long bits of paper string and rag completed the home there was very little weaving in the construction of the nest and the most wonderful as well as the most curious thing about it was how it could be made so loosely and not fall apart during the very high winds which we have in central texas while the eggs were being hatched there was a violent storm which lasted all day and several times i saw the tree bend nearly to the ground each time i was afraid i should see the destruction of this home which had become so interesting to me as i watched the tree writhe in the storm i began to appreciate the wisdom shown by the bird in the selection of the place for his nest for it was in the part of the tree least disturbed by the wind and most thoroughly protected from the rain during the long nights the mockingbird often sang to his mate as she patiently sat on the nest nothing can be more delightful than the song of our mockingbirds heard when the moonlight makes the night almost as light as the day and the south wind is laden with the delicious odors of roses and honeysuckle at last the eggs were hatched and five baby birds demanded food the parent birds worked constantly from dawn till dusk but from the loud c c c which greeted them each time they neared the nest one might suppose the supply of food never equaled the demand a young mockingbird seems all mouth and legs he is a comical little creature with his scant covering of gray down long legs large feet and ever open mouth with its lining of bright orange as the old bird approaches the little ones squat flat in the nest throw back their heads and open their enormous mouths which must seem like so many bottomless pits to the parent birds when they are tired if my favorite cat mephistopheles tried to take his nap anywhere in the vicinity of their nest jack and jill would fly at him screaming and boldly lighting upon his head try to peck out his eyes he would strike at them and spit but they would only fly upon the fence or rose trellis and in a moment dart at him again the battle would continue until mephistopheles retired to a safer place i have seen many such battles but never one where the bird was not victorious one morning when the birds were still quite small one of them tumbled from the nest at first i thought the mother bird might have pushed it out that it might learn to fly but after seeing the feathers of its wings had only reached the tiny pin feather stage i knew it was too young for such efforts and concluded that the nest was overcrowded i tried to put it in the nest for it was drenched with the dew from the grass jack and jill objected so seriously to my assistance that i had to give up this plan for they flew at me just as they did at mephistopheles fearing the cat would hurt it i was compelled to take it into the house then my troubles began it seemed to take all of my time to feed this one bird and i could not imagine how jack and jill could take care of it and four others for a while it seemed very much frightened but at length began to chirp the old birds answered at once and soon came to the screen on the window and called to it knowing they would feed it if they could reach it i had to keep it away from them for should they discover it was a prisoner they would give it poison we named it chippy and it soon became a great pet wherever any one entered the room where it was its mouth flew open and from its shrill chee 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 one might easily imagine it was on the verge of starvation when i had had it a week it would try to fly from the floor to the lower rounds of a chair when it had learned to fly if left alone it would call until someone answered and then follow the sound until it found them i have known it to fly through two rooms a downstairs hall up the stair steps through the upper hall and into my room in response to my whistle when it first made this journey it could fly only two or three feet at a time 
and had to fly from step to step up the stairway soon after this i took chippy out of doors he was very much delighted when placed in a young hackberry tree where he could fly from branch to branch when he reached the top of the tree jill flew into a tree near by and tried to coax him to come to her i saw chippy spread his wings and supposed i had lost my pet imagine my surprise when he gave a shrill scream and flew straight to me lighting on my shoulder and nestling against my face jill followed him resting in a vine some three or four feet from me when coaxing failed she flew away but soon returned with a grasshopper in her bill i drove chippy away from me hoping he would return to his own family where his education could be carried on according to their ideas he flew into a tree ate the grasshopper which jill fed to him and then flew on the roof of the porch outside my window where he sat calling me going to my room i opened the screen to let him in but this startled him and he flew away the sun had gone down by this time and i supposed he had at last returned to the nest as i sat at the supper table i heard him calling to me and went outside he was in a tree in a neighbor's yard but when he saw me he at once flew down on my head and it was comical to see him try to express his joy after that he spent his days among the trees but at sunset always came to the house and slept in a box in my room whenever he was hungry he would come to the window and call for food his favorite resting place was on my shoulder or head and he seemed to be very fond of company one morning i saw jack and jill flying from tree to tree with him and that is the last i ever saw of any of them end of section eleven section twelve of birds and all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by jill ingle birdland secrets by sarah e graves tell me what the bluebird sings when from southland up he springs into march's frosty skies and to our new england flies where upon some sunny morn hear we first his note love lorn now he mung the maple flits now upon a fence post sits lifting wings of heaven's own blue as he warbles clear and true song so plaintive soft and sweet all our hearts with welcome beat what the message full he brings when in march's ear he sings tell me what our robins think when our april airs they drink following close in bluebird's train with their blither bolder strain sit they high on maple tall chirping loud their earnest call red breast glowing in the sun then across the sward they run scampering briskly then upright flirt their tails and spring to flight or when drops the light of day down the westward golden way robin mounts the tallest branch touched by sunset's quivering lance carols forth his evening tune blithe as earth were in her june tell me what the sparrow says in those first glad springtime days when the maples yield their sweet when earth's waking pulses beat when the swollen streams and rills frolic down the pasture hills winter birds and squirrels then grow more lively in the glen and when warmer airs arise sparrow sings her sweet surprise from the lilac bushes near song of faith and hope and cheer tell me when the longer train up from the southland sweeps again filling fields and glens and woods wildest deepest solitudes with more brilliant life and song golden lyre and silver tongue bells that ring their morning chimes wood nymphs voicing soothing rhymes stirring all the sun-filled air with hymns of praise and love and prayer tell me whence their motive power tell me whence so rich a dower tell me why are birds so gifted whence their imprisoned spirits drifted whither swells this tide of love flooding all the air above whither these enchantments tend a brief bird life is this its end end of section twelve this recording is in the public domain section thirteen of birds in all nature volume seven number four April 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org. 
The Messina Quail, Certainix Messina. This beautiful species is said to be by far the most gentle and unsuspicious of our quails, and will permit a very close approach by man, showing little or no fear of what most animals know so well to be their most deadly enemy. While feeding, they keep close together, and constantly utter a soft clucking note, as though talking to one another. This species is about the size of the eastern variety. Its head is ornamented with a beautifully full, soft, occipital crest. The head of the male is singularly striped with black and white. The female is smaller and is quite different in color, but may be recognized by the generic characters. The tail is short and full, and the claws very large. The quail makes a simple nest on the ground, under the edge of some old log, or in the thick of grass on the prairie, lined with soft and well-dried grass and a few feathers. From fifteen to twenty-four white eggs are laid. The female sits three weeks. The young brood, as soon as they are fairly out of the shell, leave the nest and seem abundantly strong to follow the parent, though they are no bigger than the end of one's thumb, covered with down. The Messina quail is an inhabitant of the western and southwestern states. End of section 13. This recording is in the public domain. Section 14 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. In the Old Log House by Bertha C.V. Sonia The big orchard on the Triggs place was also the old orchard. Grandpa Triggs had planted it long ago in his young days when the country was new. The year before he had hauled logs from yonder forest with his ox team and built the strong little house that still stands at the foot of the orchard. He brought young crab trees too and set them all about the house and though after the orchard was started he often threatened to cut them down, he never did it and they grew into a tangle of friendship and protection until the little one-roomed house was nearly hidden. The house was desolate now. The catbirds built their nests in the crotches of the crabs and the jays came over from the woods across the river and quarreled with them. An old zigzag rail fence separated the orchard from the hayfield at one end, and a tall, uncared-for Osage hedge did scant duty at two sides. Once in a great while a sheep would leave the aftermath and step through the wide spaces of the hedge, and, entering the doorless house, would walk curiously about and then return. But that was all. No, not quite all. The children built fires in the great fireplace and roasted potatoes or experimented at cooking carrots, artichokes, apples, and occasionally a pair of kidneys rolled each in several thicknesses of brown paper and slowly cooked under the hot ashes and coals. To be sure, the smoke came out into the room and got into the children's eyes and passed out at the door, for the chimney had crumbled to half its old-time height. But the playtimes went on in spite of that, and the birds shouted and sang outside. One would expect that all this activity above board to be happily interested without looking for new and startling circumstances underground. But, withal, life went on among the underground lights, with its busy unconcern of affairs which it could not share or even comprehend. Rarely, when the fire warmed the bricks about the fireplace, did comely plumped Mrs. Aker Tidy fail to raise her song. She had a way of building a home, had Mrs. House Cricket. She tossed out a few grains of earth from under the brick tiling of the hearth, and, presto, she entered in backward and sat down, waving her long slender antennae, with a happy content that would shame many a one who, having more, is not satisfied. 
Mr. Field Cricket, who happens also to be named Acre Tidey, had built his home at the edge of the path in the sandy loam just without the door. Two bodies of the same name and family would be expected to live in the same house, but they couldn't quite come to do that on account of tastes. For one thing they differed in the matter of dress, though that was the least objection one to the other. Mrs. House Cricket wore a greyish-yellow dress, marked a little with brown, and Mr. Field Cricket wore darker colours. He built his home deeper, too, which would never suit Mrs. Acre Tidey at all. Sometimes his home is twelve inches deep and six it is sure to be, and then, big fellow that he is, quite a bit larger than she, he does not mind the cold. He snuggles down in the deep darkness as soon as he sees the dew frozen in the tiny crystals all over the long grass blades, and sleeps the time away, however long and cold the winter may be and such a life is scorned by bright Mrs. House Cricket, who chooses the hearth on account of the warmth, and who chirps joyfully throughout the year, except when the fire goes out, and it often does in the little old log house, for there were days and days when the children did not come to play. At such times Mrs. House Cricket was forced unwillingly to fall asleep. Shameful, she would mutter, as the last flicker of feeling departed. Such a waste of time! If I had built in a bakery, or by a brick oven, how much busier I might be, and happier! I am no better than those cousins of mine who make it a business to sleep half the year round. These last words were so soft as she scraped them off on the ridges of her wing covers that the children, who were just going home, stopped, and Lindsay said, Do hear the cricket. It says, Good night, good night. Bye-bye, Crick, called Harry as he leaped through the hedge and ran to the brook to stamp on the thin ice with his heel. I shall move out, moaned Mrs. Cricket with her faintest note. But moving day did not arrive for many weeks, and Mrs. Cricket awoke and went to sleep as many times, and finally the long hot days found her contentedly basking in the field among the warm grasses, having forgotten the troubles of the winter. Dear me, she was softly drumming with her wing covers as she stopped in her evening search for food. Dear, dear, how that big cousin of mine does scream. Perhaps he calls it music, but I don't. She crept along slowly and hid in a fold of rain-worn paper near the home of her much-criticized relative. He was sitting in his doorway, singing his evening song as loud as he could, for he was singing with a purpose. The source of his music lay within his wing covers. Nearly one hundred and thirty fine ridges were on the underside of one wing cover, which is hard and horny, and these are hastily scraped over a smooth nervure, which projects from the underside of the other wing cover. And that is how he sings. His song is bound to be a love song, and Mrs. House Cricket, finding a few crumbs within the paper and deciding to stay all night, suddenly heard the loud, harsh tones softened, and, looking out, she saw her big cousin standing close to another dark form like his own. He was crooning softly as he caressed her with his slender, delicate antennae, his mate, whom he had won to himself with his song. Mrs. House Cricket looked on for a moment and changed her mind about staying all night. I'll creep under a leaf, she said, and leave the lovers to themselves. 
so she slipped away and saw them no more until some weeks later she passed and seeing her cousin in his door stopped i have all my eggs laid she said and i am going up toward the big house to stay until the weather gets cold mrs field cricket has two hundred eggs right here under this long grass he answered with great pride she is welcome returned his cousin for my part i prefer quality to quantity and she turned away to take a peep at the nursery which was warmed and nourished only by the sun they will soon hatch out and dig homes each for himself like my own little ones she said as she left them and began her long journey toward the farmhouse but mine will be wise enough to get near to a barn or house when they are grown up she mused so that they need not sleep all winter and they can be busy and useful to the world busy useful cheerful hopeful she stopped to say one or the other of these good words often as she travelled on and sometimes she said them all at one time as she pruned her wings which when folded extended beyond her body into long slender filaments like the antennae at length just as the maple leaves all brown and dry were blowing into heaps against the rose bushes and the lilacs mrs acre reached the farmhouse and slipped unobserved into the warm clean kitchen she found a wide crack in the floor near the big chimney and squeezed in digging it out to suit her body the babies are all safe in their little holes by this time she said safe for the winter perhaps by next fall they will be with me and we will all go out at night to eat crumbs and she began singing useful cheerful busy hopeful do hear the cricket said lindsay it sounds like the one in the old log house they are all alike i guess returned harry who was eating apples they are always jolly sad i reckon useful cheerful hopeful sang mrs cricket end of section 14section fifteen of birds and all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by betty b animals as patients monsieur lepinay the presiding genius of the bird hospital in paris has found by experience that his feathered patients chiefly exhibit a tendency toward apoplexy the dove is particularly addicted to this complaint consumption follows an order of unpopularity with internal complaints occupying the third place in the case of apoplexy bloodletting so popular a remedy in the days of our great-grandparents is resorted to by means of a diminutive lancet inserted in a fleshy portion of the bird and this is followed by small doses of such drugs as quinine bromide of camphor etc apropos of dog's teeth about a year ago there was exhibited at a certain show a very interesting and aged skipperkey who was at that time the only dog in the world boasting a complete set of false teeth his owner mr mosley is a dentist as well as a lover of animals and it is entirely due to his skill that the little dog is able to eat with perfect comfort by the aid of the artificial molars provided for him by his master who on another occasion provided a dog who had lost a limb in an accident with an artificial leg the only horse possessing a full set of false teeth was the property of mr henry lloyd of louisville kentucky who had its diseased teeth extracted and replaced by a set of false ones a swan that had had a leg run over by a cartwheel causing a compound fracture was recently successfully treated at otley england while yet another swan had an operation performed at darlington some little time ago that was very much out of the ordinary in this instance the unlucky bird had the principal bone in its right wing fractured 
in several places the fracture presumably being caused by a brutal blow dealt by some unknown ruffian a veterinary surgeon was asked to give his advice and on his recommendation an amputation was decided upon and this he successfully performed the bird sans a wing was when last heard of well on the road to recovery end of section fifteen this recording is in the public domain section sixteen of birds and all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david lawrence in wasega beach january two thousand seventeen the triplet tree by charles coke woods ph d matter per se is an evidence of mind every material thing enshrines a thought essential nature has no superfluities to the thinker everything means something in nature nothing happens everything is ordered there can be no portrait of a landscape without a painter there can be no landscape without a maker the visible forms that nature takes may be changed her invisible forms are changeless the search for the changeless is the great and delightful task of art literature science philosophy and religion the ultimate in nature and in art is divine the permanent principle survives the fleeting form nature's principles are relatively few her forms are multifarious tree life is true life it is natural it is therefore true nature's garb may be odd it may even be deformed but her inner self is never false sap fiber leaf blossom fruit this is nature's apocalypse it is queen beauty's progressive revelation trees usually grow singly under certain conditions they may as naturally grow otherwise the unusual is not necessarily the unnatural nature's resources are vast she may at any time manifest herself in an unfamiliar form the triplet tree grows on what is known as green's ranch in cowley county kansas the ranch is located five miles northeast of arkansas city the trees are about three hundred yards from the west bank of the walnut river they range in a line running north and south they are between forty-five and fifty feet tall the first two on the north are eighteen inches apart the third tree standing at the south end of the row is fifteen feet from the middle one they are water elms and average about three and one-half feet in girth the tree standing at the north end of the row is hollow at the base and leaning over southward intersects the central tree two feet from the ground thence it extends to the one at the south end of the row and intersects it with a limb from either side twelve feet above the ground the segment of the circle described by the leaning tree is about twenty feet at the points where the cross tree intersects the other two it is not merely a case of contiguity but of actual identification another feature of the leaning tree is that halfway between its base and the trunk of the second and on the lower side is an unsightly knot about as large as a half bushel measure halfway between the center tree and the one on the south and on the under side of the leaning tree is another lump similar to the first about half the size these unsightly warts appear to have been produced by a congestion of sap in the tissue of the intersecting tree. This triplet tree is a curiosity. It presents a strange phenomenon in tree formation. But nature is everywhere full of mystery and surprises. End of section 16 Section 17 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, 
April 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lawrence in Wasega Beach, January 2017. Countries Devoid of Trees Anyone who has traveled through the comparatively treeless countries around the Mediterranean, such as Spain, Sicily, Greece, northern Africa, and large portions of Italy, must fervently pray that our own country may be preserved from so dismal a fate, says President Charles E. Eliot. It is not the loss of the forest only that is to be dreaded, but the loss of agricultural regions now fertile and populous, which may be desolated by the floods that rush down from the bare hills and mountains, bringing with them vast quantities of sand and gravel to be spread over the lowlands. Traveling a few years ago through Tunisie, I came suddenly upon a fine Roman bridge of stone over a wide, bare, dry riverbed. It stood some thirty feet above the bed of the river and had once served the needs of a prosperous population. Marveling at the height of the bridge above the ground, I asked the French station master if the river ever rose to the arches which carried the roadway of the bridge. His answer testified to the flooding capacity of the river and to the strength of the bridge. He said, I have been here four years, and three times I have seen the river running over the parapets of that bridge. That country was once one of the richest granaries of the Roman Empire. Now it yields a scanty support for a sparse and semi-barbarous population. The whole region round about is treeless. The care of the national forest is a provision for future generations. For the permanence of vast areas of our country, of the great industries of agriculture and mining, upon which the prosperity of the country ultimately depends. A good forest administration would soon support itself. From Atlantic Canada. End of section 17. Section 18 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Betty B. Snow Prisons of Game Birds A late-season snowstorm, with the heavy precipitation that marked the storm of February 28th, gives the heart of the sportsman, as well as that of the bird protector, a touch of anxiety on the score of the ruffed grouse and quail. A downfall of that kind, followed by a thaw and then by a freeze at night, means the death of hundreds of game birds the quail simply get starved and cold killed while the ruffed grouse or partridges get locked up by jack frost and die of hunger in their prisons there is a patch of woods not far from delavan wisconsin where there was until recently an abundance of these game birds there was a local snowstorm there late in february last year which was followed by a day of sunshine and then by a frost which covered the snow with a heavy crust grouse have a habit of escaping from the cold and blustering winds by burying themselves in the big snowdrifts at the edges of the woods there they lie snug and warm and are perhaps loath to leave their comfortable quarters they sometimes stay in the drift until the delay costs them their lives the crust forming and walling them in it so happened to sixteen partridges in the woodland patch near delavan with the melting of the season's snows the bodies of the birds were found they were separated from one another by only a few feet it was a veritable grouse graveyard tribune warm grows the wind and the rain hammers daily making small doorways to let in the sun flowers spring up and new leaves flutter gaily back fly the birdlings for winter is done justine stearns end of section eighteen this recording is in the public domain section nineteen of birds in all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org 
The Ring-Billed Duck Ithia Calaris This duck has many popular synonyms, among others ring-necked, ring-billed shuffler, ring-necked scalp duck, or blue-bill fall duck, Minnesota, blackjack, Illinois, moonbill, South Carolina. It is found throughout the whole of North America, south to Guatemala, and the West Indies, breeding from Iowa, southern Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Maine northward. It is accidental in Europe. The chief variation in the plumage of this species consists in the distinctness of the chestnut collar in the male, which is usually well defined, particularly in front. There is very little in its habits to distinguish it from the other blackheads. Like them, it usually associates in small flocks. Its flesh is excellent, being fat, tender, and juicy. End of section 19. This recording is in the public domain. Section 20 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Betty B. A Strange Bird House, Addie L. Booker. Wrens are famous for choosing queer places for nesting sites. They will nest in almost any situation about the house or yard that can be entered through any semblance of a hole. I place all kinds of odd receptacles about the yard for them every spring, which they seldom fail to occupy. These friendly and interesting little creatures appreciate such thoughtfulness and repay it by fairly bubbling over with grateful song. But the pair that afforded me the most amusement preempted a homestead that was not intended for them. Our acquaintance began when preparing to remove the cook stove to the summer kitchen in May. In winter, this kitchen is used as a sort of lumber room, and when clearing it of various odd and ends, it was found that a pair of wrens had taken possession of an overshoe and laid the foundation of a home. The pair of overshoes had been tied together and hung on a nail in the wall, about five feet from the floor. Needless to say, they were left undisturbed, though not without many doubts of the feasibility of the enterprise on account of the proximity of the stove the shoes were the ordinary kind fleece-lined rubber and were only a few feet from where the stove would be set these conditions warranted the expectation of disastrous results from extreme heat at least so it seemed to me but my little neighbors thought otherwise and nest building progressed rapidly being remarkably industrious midgets the nest of sticks was soon finished and lined with soft feathers from the poultry yard wrens are noted for their industry unless in a very restricted situation the outside dimensions of the nest are enormous when compared with the interior or cavity and the twigs that compose the structure are out of all proportion to the size of the architects i have seen twigs a foot long and half the size of a lead pencil used in the construction of their nests that birds so diminutive could carry such burdens in their tiny bills is indeed wonderful it is said that a single pair have been known to fill a barrel but no nest quite so mammoth as this has ever come under my observation to return to the home in the shoes after the completion of the nest five wee eggs were deposited therein and incubation began and in spite of the heat everything went on happily in this unique domicile we soon became the most sociable friends. Their quaint and charming ways made them very amusing pets. They became so tame that they would approach me fearlessly, even alighting on my head, and would let me examine their nest without being frightened. The wren is a very lively and active bird, and sings incessantly throughout the breeding season, and these were not an exception, but were forever darting in and out, their actions accompanied by a sweet warble mr wren would positively quiver all over with delight while regaling mrs wren and me with his exuberant melody they were the cheeriest little companions imaginable every morning as i entered the kitchen i was greeted heartily by my small neighbors who bustled about in the preparation 
of the morning meal as busily as i meanwhile mr wren merrily sang his innocent matin song and spontaneously i would find myself singing too as i went about my work one day there was great excitement in the shoe and when i looked in five featherless mites with huge mouths were to be seen mrs wren was now a veritable old woman who lived in a shoe but she did not treat her children as did the old woman of nursery fame though she was kept very busy in supplying their wants even with the assistance of mr wren these birds subsist on small insects and consume a considerable quantity with much satisfaction i watched them slay a host of ants that were invading the kitchen running up and down the wall with much agility they picked the ants off real warm weather had set in by the time the nestlings were ready to try their wings and i thought of course my friends would desert me for a cooler resort out of doors in which to pass the heated term but oh no they were too loyal for that so to make their house more commodious another room was added by building a nest in the other shoe and the family raised in the second shoe was not a whit less interesting than the first end of section twenty this recording is in the public domain section twenty one of birds and all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by jill ingle the chickadee by sidney dare were it not for me said a chickadee not a single flower on earth would be for under the ground they soundly sleep and never venture an upward peep till they hear from me chickadee dee i tell jack frost when tis time to go and carry away the ice and snow and then i hint to the jolly old sun a little spring work sir should be done and he smiles around on the frozen ground and i keep up my cheery cheery sound till echo declares in glee in glee tis he tis he the chickadee dee and then i waken the birds of spring ho ho tis time to be on the wing they trill and twitter and soar aloft and i send the winds to whisper soft down by the little flower beds saying come show your pretty heads the spring is coming you see you see for so he sings the chickadee dee the sun he smiled and the early flowers bloomed to brighten the blithesome hours and songbirds gathered in bush and tree but the wind he laughed right merrily as the saucy mite of a snowbird he chirped away do you see 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 i did it all chickadee dee end of section twenty one this recording is in the public domain section twenty two of birds in all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by larry wilson reflections charles c marble vice often epitomizes ancestry the wisest are not so wise as silence experience is the grave of enthusiasm experience is the enemy of dogmatism our faith is often nothing more than our hope should we despise anything that god has made in bestowing benefits we imperil friendship innocence and guilt are alike suffused with blushes if vice did not exist wisdom could not predicate itself disappointment leaves a scar which hope cannot remove success is an excellent proof of the wisdom which achieved it the vices of some men are more endurable than the virtues of others beauty is a reproach without virtue while virtue is itself the highest beauty the sun at noon gives no more light than at morn but its glow has more warmth and power without the accessories life were of little worth and hope gives it its permanence and serenity marriage should be in harmony with nature in which what is seemingly discordant but illuminates and purifies it our conduct toward one another should be based upon a conception of the infinite mischances of life and the exquisite poignancy of regret 
misfortune seeks consolation in communicating itself but when it no longer needs sympathy it is silent and ashamed of its former volubility we can overcome even our prejudices where some interest is subserved by it so much stronger is self-interest than color social status or education the poet should know better than another his limitations parnassus is always higher than our dreams and his summit more radiant than the vision of any mortal the lily of the valley which hides its chaste head in dewy leaflets is a thousand times less modest than the maiden whose conscious blush reveals the innocence of reason if we were to judge all men by what they seem to have achieved we would be harsh and unjust we cannot always see the scar left by a heroic deed and modesty conceals it complete benevolence implies simplicity of living the christian cannot have if he knows that others have not thoreau was perhaps the wisest man of his time he practised what he preached and there are few examples of simplicity to compare with his nothing perhaps is more humiliating than to observe the precocious development of the negative virtues especially prudence there is a subtle suspiciousness in early prudence which is at war with all generous impulses think of the pinched heart of a little miser there is a selfishness which deals generously with its own my wife my children shall be arrayed in the richest shall feed upon the daintiest my servant my handmaid they are not to me nature hath made nothing better than my desert she hath made nothing poor enough for thee and thine in an old man conceit may be so comprehensive as to include the race has he been reasonably successful with the fair sex all are the subjects of his whim or desire and he will sententiously and confidently repel any claim of virtue or purity so blind is he to the centuries made splendid by her virtue and self-sacrifice and so little is his judgment affected by objects unconnected with self end of section twenty two this recording is in the public domain Section 23 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. Foxglove, Digitalis purpurea L. Dr. Albert Schneider, Northwestern University School of Pharmacy pan through the pastures oftentimes hath run to pluck the speckled foxgloves from their stems w brown britannia's pastorals volume four the foxglove is a biennial herb from two to seven feet in height with a solitary sparingly branched stem the basal leaves are very large and broad gradually becoming narrower and smaller toward the apex of the stem and its branches dark green in color, pubescent, margin dentate, venation very prominent. The inflorescence is very characteristic. The large, numerous flowers are closely crowded and pendulous from one side of the arched stalk. The corolla is purple and spotted on the inside. It is a very handsome plant, widely distributed, preferring a sandy or gravelly soil in open woods. When abundant and in full bloom, it makes a beautiful exhibit. It is a garden favorite in many lands. The plant is apparently not mentioned in the works of older authors. It was not known to the ancient Greeks and Romans. It was, however, used medicinally in the northern countries of Europe since very remote times. The Anglo-Saxon word foxglove is derived from the Welsh, 11th century, fox's glue, meaning fox music, in allusion to an ancient musical instrument consisting of bells hung on an arch to support. In the Scandinavian idioms, the plant bears the name of fox's bells. The German name Fingerhut, 
meaning finger hat, hence thimble, is derived from the resemblance of the flower to a thimble. Still more poetical is the name Waldglocklein, meaning little forest bells, in reference to the inflorescence. In England, the flowers are known as fox's fingers, ladies' fingers, and dead men's bells. According to an old English work on medicine, the early physicians of Wales and England applied this drug externally only. It was not until 1775 when the English physician Withering began to use it internally, especially in the treatment of hydrophobia. Modern physicians consider digitalis one of the most important medicinal plants. It is a very powerful, hence very poisonous, drug, its action being due to an active principle known as digitalin. Its principal use is in the treatment of deficient heart action due to various causes, but especially when due to valvular lesions. The physician must, however, observe great care in its administration, not only because of its powerful action, but also because of its cumulative action. That is, the effect of the drug increases, although only normal medicinal doses are given at regular intervals, so that fatal poisoning may result, especially if the patient should attempt to rise suddenly. The physician guards against this by gradually decreasing the dose or by discontinuing it for a time and by requiring the patient to remain in a recumbent position while under the influence of the drug. For medicinal use, the leaves from the wild growing plants are preferred because they contain more of the active principle. The leaves are collected when about half of the flowers are expanded, and since it is a biennial, that would be during the second year. The first year leaves are, however, often used or added. Like all valuable drugs, it is often adulterated. The leaves of Anula caniza, Baumann's spikenard, Symphytum officinale, comfrey, and Verbascum thapsis, mullein, being used for that purpose. The odor of the bruised green leaves is heavy or nauseous, while that of the dried leaves is fragrant, resembling the odor of tea. The taste is quite bitter. Formerly, the roots, flowers, and seeds were also used medicinally. End of section 23. Section 24 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Betty B. Fruit Bats of the Philippines. The Agricultural Department at Washington is taking precautions to prevent the importation into the United States of any of the animal pests which are found in Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and the other new colonies. Among these, none is more feared than the great fruit bats which abound in the Philippines. A full-grown specimen of the fruit bat measures five feet from tip to tip of its wings. The fruit bats live together in immense communities and feed almost all together on tropical and subtropical fruits. They crowd together so thickly on the trees that sometimes large branches are broken down by their weight. In Australia, they have increased so rapidly that great sums of money have been spent in their destruction. One organized movement of the fruit growers of New South Wales recently resulting in the killing of 100,000 bats at a cost of 30 cents each another possible immigrant which is much dreaded is the mongoose which abounds in cuba puerto rico and the other west indian islands the mongoose was first brought to the islands for the purpose of destroying the rats and mice which it did so thoroughly that it was soon forced to adapt itself to another diet it was found that the mongoose thrived on young poultry birds and even young pigs and lambs while it also consumed great quantities of pineapples bananas corn and other vegetable products end of section 24 this recording is in the public domain section 25 of birds in all nature volume 7 number 4 april 1900 recorded for librivox.org by aaron rivera monkeys as gold finders Captain E. Moss of the Transvaal tells the following story of the monkeys who work for him in the mines. I have twenty-four monkeys, said he, employed about my mines. They do the work of seven able-bodied men. 
In many instances, they lend valuable aid where a man is useless. They gather up the small pieces of quartz that would be passed unnoticed by the working men and pile them up in little heaps that can be easily gathered up in a shovel and thrown into a mill. They work just as they please, sometimes going down into the mines when they have cleared up all the debris on the outside. They live and work together without quarreling any more than men do. They're quite methodical in their habits and go to work and finish up in the same manner as human beings would do under similar circumstances. It's very interesting to watch them at their labor and see how carefully they look after every detail of the work they attempt. They clean up about the mines, follow the wheelbarrows and carts used in the mining, and pick up everything that falls off the way. Tit bits. End of section 25. This recording is in the public domain. Section 26 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Plea for the Trees Anne Wakely Jackson Much has been written, and more has been said, in regard to the prevention of cruelty to children and the prevention of cruelty to animals, but has anyone ever urged upon the public the prevention of cruelty to trees? It is time someone did, for people nowadays seem to have no regard whatever for a tree's feelings, but saw and hack a limb off here or there at any season of the year the notion happens to seize them, and leave the poor thing maimed and disfigured, and perhaps pouring out its life-blood from the ugly wound. If you are insensible to the beauty, the blessing, and benignity of trees, there is no use in appealing to you. But surely you are not. Surely you can call to mind some old tree that brings up memories of the past and appeals to you with almost human tenderness. Then, for the sake of these old, tried, and well-beloved friends, look with compassion upon all trees and discourage those who would spoil and disfigure them. Have you ever thought how sad a tree must feel when it is transplanted from the forest to the city or town? How it must miss its tall and stalwart companions, the shy woodland birds, and the flowers that spring up around it each year. The parting from them all is bad enough, but there is worse to come. It little dreams of the hideous and deforming trimming that will begin as soon as it commences to spread its tiny branches. Poor little tree! I wonder it does not die of grief and pain. Doubtless it sighs and sobs out its longing for the old free home, in the ears of the passing wind, though we are too dull to understand its murmuring voice. If the wind is in a good humor, he caresses it gently and tries to comfort it. But sometimes he is angry, and then he shakes the poor tree fiercely. But it loves him always, whether he is gentle or rough. I suppose it is sometimes necessary to trim trees, I hear people say so, but I think a tree of beautiful and perfect shape is more desirable than the little patch of lawn that might be gained by trimming it up. Ought not one to consider and carefully study the tree as a whole before venturing to remove any of its branches? To examine it from every point of view, above all, if your tree must be trimmed, see about it yourself and don't trust them to the ruthless hands of people insensible to beauty those to whom a tree is only so much wood, and be very sure your cause is justifiable before you allow them to be touched. Remember that the finest trees are of slow growth, and if ever you are tempted to cut down a really fine one, just stop a moment and reflect that it may take half a lifetime to replace it. If these people who have a mania for cutting down trees could be persuaded to plant a new one for every old one they sacrifice, what a blessing it would be to future generations. End of section 26 The sycophant succeeds where the self-respecting man fails, yet the former is despised and the latter revered. 
The first is happy if he secure the favor of the great. The latter is content if he can secure that of himself. Charles Churchill Marble End of section 27 This recording is in the public domain. Section 28 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900 Recorded for LibriVox.org by Jill Engel That I may help the depth and dream of my desire, the bitter paths wherein I stray, thou knowest who hast made the fire, thou knowest who hast made the clay. One stone the more swings to her place in that dread temple of thy worth. It is enough that through thy grace I saw not common on thy earth. Take not that vision from my ken, O oh, whatsoe'er may spoil or speed, help me to need no aid from men, that I may help such men as need. Rudyard Kipling End of section 28 This recording is in the public domain. Section 29 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900 Recorded for LibriVox.org by Jill Ingle A Tragedy in Three Parts Part 1. The Bonnet a bit of foundation as big as your hand, bows of ribbon and lace, wire sufficient to make them stand, a handful of roses, a velvet band, it lacks but one crowning grace. Part Two, The Bird A chirp, a twitter, a flash of wings, four wide-open mouths in a nest, from morning till night she brings and brings, for growing birds they are hungry things, aye, hungry things at the best. The crack of a rifle, a shot well sped, a crimson stain on the grass. Four hungry birds in a nest, unfed. Ah, well, we will leave the rest unsaid. Some things it were better to pass. Part Three, The Wearer The lady has surely a beautiful face. She has surely a queenly air. The bonnet had flowers and ribbon and lace, but the bird had added the crowning grace. It really is a charming affair. Is the love of a bonnet supreme over all in a lady so faultlessly fair? The father takes heed when the sparrows fall, he hears when the starving nestlings call. Can a tender woman not care? Anonymous End of section 29. This recording is in the public domain. Section 30 of Birds and All Nature Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Betty B. Strange Plants One of the most remarkable growths in the government botanical gardens is the so-called barber plant, the leaves of which are used in some parts of the East by rubbing on the face to keep the beard from growing. It is not supposed to have any effect on a beard that is already rooted, but merely to act as a preventive boys employing it to keep the hair from getting a start on their faces it is also employed by some oriental people who desire to keep a part of their heads free from hair as a matter of fashion a curious looking tree from the isthmus of panama bears a round red fruit as big as an apple which has this remarkable faculty that its juice rubbed on tough beef or chicken makes the meat tender by the chemical power it possesses to separate the flesh fiber one is interested to observe in the botanical greenhouses three kinds of plants that have real consumption of the lungs the leaves of course being the lungs of a plant the disease is manifested by the turning of the leaves from green to white the affection gradually spreading from one spot until when a leaf is all white it is just about to die cruelly enough as it would seem the gardeners only try to perpetuate the disease for the sake of beauty and curiosity all plants of those varieties that are too healthy being thrown away end of section thirty this recording is in the public domain section thirty one of birds and all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred Recorded for LibriVox.org by Betty B. 
a brigand bird the kia is an outlaw bird of new zealand for each of whose bills the government offers a reward of a shilling the kia is a gourmand it prefers the kidney of a sheep to any other part of the beast coming down out of the mountains in winter it attacks the sheep alighting on their backs and tearing away the hide and flesh until it reaches the tidbits which it seeks how the birds learn to tear away the skin to get at the flesh forms a curious story of the development of bird knowledge the birds had been feeding on the refuse of cattle and sheep killed for human consumption they learned to associate the idea of meat with the living animal and now they kill the sheep for the meat without waiting for human aid or consent the maoris have a legend about this bird to the effect that it used to be a strict vegetarian building its nest on the ground the sheep came and trampled on the nests and the birds attacked them furiously drawing blood they like the flavor of flesh and have ever since been eating it the bird builds its nest in trees now out of the reach of the sheep's hoofs end of section thirty one this recording is in the public domain section thirty two of birds and all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by larry wilson the brook little brook little brook you have such a happy look such a very merry manner as you swerve and curve and crook and your ripples one by one reach each other's hands and run like laughing little children in the sun little brook sing to me sing about a bumblebee that tumbled from a lily bell and mumbled grumblingly because we wet the film of his wings and had to swim while the water bugs raced round and laughed at him little brook sing a song of a leaf that sailed along down the golden braided centre of your curd swift and strong and the dragonfly that lit on the tilting rim of it and sailed away and wasn't scared a bit and sing how oft in glee came a truant boy like me who loved to lean and listen to your lilting melody till the gurgle and refrain of your music in his brain caused a happiness as deep to him as pain little brook laugh and leap do not let the dreamer weep sing him all the songs of summer till he sink in softest sleep and then sing soft and low through his dreams of long ago sing back to him the rest he used to know anonymous end of section thirty two this recording is in the public domain section thirty three of birds and all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jill ingle the blood root by william care highly secretary of the chicago academy of sciences thou firstborn of the year's delight pride of the dewy glade in vernal green and virgin white thy vestal robes arrayed kebble the true lover of flowers though he may be enraptured by those under cultivation finds a greater satisfaction in the study and observation of those that are developed only under the influence of nature's laws in the field the forest and even in the sea there are plants not only pleasing to the eye but are doubly interesting because of the wonderful provision made for them to assure their survival plants like animals have their enemies and sometimes it seems that with thoughtful care for its own protection a species will gradually change its habits thus conveying a sense of danger to its descendants many of the peculiarities of plants that fit them for existence may be readily studied by the novice in botany as he tramps the fields in search of recreation there is nothing more delightful and charming to the botanist than to seek the reasons for the beauties in nature and to find why plants live and exist as they do many delicate plants seek the shelter and protection of the borders of the forest they do not penetrate far within but remain near the open where the sunlight can reach them the blood root sanguinaria canadensis is of this character beautiful and delicate it seems to shun the storm and wind 
and to retire from the gaze of man. The bloodroot belongs to the poppy family, Papaveraceae, which includes about 25 genera and over 200 species. These, though widely distributed, are chiefly found in the temperate regions of the north. To this family also belong the valuable opium-producing plant, Papaver somniferum, the Mexican or prickly poppy, Argamone mexicana, the Dutchman's breeches, Bicucula cucularia, the bleeding heart, Bicucula eximia, and the beautiful mountain fringe, Alumia fungosa. A large number of the species are cultivated for ornamental purposes. The poppy is also cultivated for the commercial value of the opium it produces. All the species produce a milky or colored juice. Here, indeed, we may say that behind beauty there lurks a deadly foe, for the juice of nearly all the species has active narcotic properties. This property is a means of protection to the plant under consideration, for its acrid taste is distasteful to animals. The red juice that exudes from all parts of the plant of the bloodroot gives it both its common and its generic names, the latter, sanguinaria, is derived from the Latin word sanguis, or blood. This interesting plant is a native of eastern North America, deriving its specific name from the fact that it is found in Canada. It blossoms in April or May. Usually but a single flower is borne by the naked stalk that rises from the underground stem to the height of about eight inches. The flowers are white, very rarely pinkish, about one and one half of an inch in diameter. The number of petals varies from 8 to 12, and they fall very soon after expansion. The sepals disappear before the bud opens. A single leaf is produced from each bud of the underground stem. It is wrapped around the flower bud as the latter rises from the soil and does not develop to full size till after the period of blossoming is over. The necessary food material for the production of the flower was stored in the underground stem during the preceding season. Thus, the green leaf is not needed early in the growth of the plant. The adult leaf is kidney-shaped, smooth, and five to nine lobed. When fully grown, they are often more than six inches in diameter. The leaf stalk, which may be over one foot in length, and the radiating veins vary in color from yellowish to orange. Few leaves are more beautiful and graceful than these, both during their development and when fully mature. It is said that the Indians formerly used the juice of this plant as a dye, and thus it is sometimes called red Indian paint and red pocoon. End of section 33. Section 34 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Betty B. Tansy cakes. Many of our garden herbs still in common use for purposes of seasoning are in reality British plants, says Longman's Magazine. Among them may be mentioned mint and marjoram and thyme and calamint, all of which may be found in their native haunts. Fennel is abundant on sea cliffs in many places in the south of England. Wild hyssop is perfectly naturalized on the picturesque ruins of Beaulieu Abbey, and wild balm used to be found within the ancient walls of Portchester Castle. The garden parsley was formerly abundant on the shingly beach at Hurst Castle, where it used to be gathered for domestic purposes. One native herb, however, much in use among our forefathers, is now seldom seen in kitchen gardens. We mean Tanacetum vulgare, the common tansy the dull yellow flowers of which are often conspicuous by the side of streams the young leaves and juice of this plant were formerly employed to give color and flavor to puddings which were known as tansy cakes or tansy puddings in medieval times the use of these cakes was specially associated with the season of easter and it is interesting to notice that in the diet rolls of st swithin's monastery at winchester which belonged to the end of the fifteenth century, we come across the entry, Tansy Tart. It has been said that the use of tansy cakes at this season was to strengthen the digestion after what an old writer calls the idle conceit of eating fish and pulse for forty days in Lent. And it is certain that this was the virtue attributed to the plant by the old herbalists. 
the herb fried with eggs which is called a tansy says culpepper helps to digest and carry away those bad humors that trouble the stomach it seems more probable that the custom of eating tansy cakes at easter time was associated with the teaching of that festival the name tansy being a corruption of a greek word meaning immortality end of section thirty four this recording is in the public domain section thirty five of birds and all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by abby the partridge call shrill and shy from the dusk they cry faintly from over the hill out of the gray where shadows lie out of the gold where sheaves are high covey to covey call and reply plaintively shy and shrill dies the day and from far away under the evening star dies the echo as dies the day droops with the dew in the new-mown hay sinks and sleeps in the scent of may dreamily faint and far frank seville in the pall mall magazine end of section thirty five this recording is in the public domain section thirty six of birds and all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by betty b our feathered neighbors burton mercer some few years ago while living in the village of west grove chester county pennsylvania i observed an unusual number of different birds in our own immediate yard and garden nearly all of which built their homes within the narrow limits of our property being deeply interested in the bird kingdom and appreciating their friendship and confidence i carefully watched the progress of their daily labors and their respective traits and individual habits our buildings consisted of a house small stable and a carpenter shop and i was much gratified to observe so many pretty birds nesting at our very doors in the front yard stood three tall pine trees in one of these a pair of blackbirds made their nest and reared two broods of young a goldfinch also chose one of the lower branches of the same tree in the forks of which the clever little fellow hung a most beautiful cup-shaped nest it appeared to be made of various mosses lichens and soft materials closely woven and cemented together and the lining inside consisted of thistledown four pretty eggs were deposited in due course and as far as i know the young were safely raised and departed with their parents in the fall i had the pleasure of seeing the entire family frequently perched on the seed salad stalks in our garden feeding in fearless content on both sides of the front porch was a lattice covered with woodbine in the top of one of these a robin chose to build her home and showed remarkable tameness during the entire nesting period on the back porch also covered with woodbine a pair of chipping sparrows built their nest a beautiful little piece of workmanship displaying skill and good taste a happy little family was raised here in safety not ten feet from the chipping sparrow's nest we nailed up a little wooden box which was tenanted for several years by a pair of house wrens in all probability the same too these little birds afforded us many hours of pleasure watching their cunning ways and listening to their cheery song in another box raised on a high pole in the garden we had a pair of purple martins for two seasons and they helped to swell the population of our bird community placed in a hedgerow bordering the yard i observed the nest and eggs of a song sparrow and their happy notes were to be heard all day long in a small briar patch in the corner of the garden a catbird made her home and became quite tame raising four little ones successfully in the eaves of the shop although not wanted or cherished the english sparrows held sway and we destroyed their nests on two or three occasions as they repeatedly tried to drive away some of our other pets summing up 
we have a total of nine different birds which nested within our small domain and in each instance they seem to feel a sense of security and protection from all harm in addition to those nesting on our premises we were favored with frequent visits from many more such as vireos orioles cardinals indigo birds chickadees nuthatches snowbirds sparrowhawks flickers etc according to the time of year prior to the summer in question my father has been very ill and as he was then getting better he spent many days on the porch this afforded ample opportunity for him to study our birds and they in like manner became so accustomed to his presence that they were quite fearless especially was this the case with the chipping sparrows above mentioned they became unusually tame during the season and the mother bird finally ate out of father's hand or would sit on the toe of his boot and pick crumbs from his fingers end of section thirty six this recording is in the public domain section thirty seven of birds and all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org the blue grosbeak this beautiful specimen of the finch family is found in the southern united states from the atlantic to the pacific although very local and irregularly distributed it is occasionally found north to kansas illinois pennsylvania and connecticut the male is brilliant blue darker across the middle of the back the female is yellowish brown above brownish yellow beneath darkest across the breast wings broadly edged with brownish yellow sometimes there is a faint trace of blue on the tail the young resemble the female males from the pacific coast region have tails considerably longer than eastern specimens while those from california are of a much lighter and less purplish blue the blue grosbeak is a very inconspicuous bird unless seen under the most favorable circumstances the adult male does not appear to be blue but of a dusky color and ridgeway says may easily be mistaken for a cow blackbird unless carefully watched besides they usually sit motionless in a watchful attitude for a considerable time and thus easily escape observation the blue grosbeak frequents the thickets of shrubs briars and tall weeds lining a stream flowing across a meadow or bordering a field or the similar growth which has sprung up in an old clearing the usual note is a strong harsh pchick, and the song of the male is a very beautiful though rather feeble warble at least two broods are raised during a season end of section thirty seven this recording is in the public domain section thirty eight of birds in all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org odd places chosen guy steely it would seem that nature had provided enough space and a sufficient variety of nooks and corners for birds to choose from and build their nests in yet it is a strange fact that many of them often prefer to follow man and select for their homes some spot he has planned and made in the fields one often sees the nests of robins and blackbirds built between the rails of pole fences and sometimes catbirds choose this situation for a home around the barns will be found the swallows and their curious nests of mud then there are those cheerful and always friendly little birds the wrens which think that our houses are just the homes they would like to and any box or can or what is prettiest of all a miniature cottage placed on a fence will rarely ever remain unoccupied during the summer even the shy bluebirds whose sheen of feathers seems to be borrowed from the sky like to peep into these of all the wild birds i believe i love the wrens the best they are always so busy and yet so companionable last spring when the days began to get warm i left the window of my room open to admit the fresh free air and on going in there one day i spied one of these spry little fellows peeping and hopping around the curtains which were looped up forming a cosy recess 
He did not seem to be alarmed at my presence, but calmly went on with his inspection. And would you believe it, the next morning, the pair of them were busy constructing their nest in this nook. I let the window remain open all summer, and they raised their family there. But the strangest of all strange sights in which I ever found a nest was nearly at the bottom of a deep well. This well was walled up with rock and a couple of brown field birds carried twigs and grass down it and formed their nest on a projecting spur of stone. Why they should choose such a location as this, it is hard to tell. End of section 38 This recording is in the public domain.